This is something that comes up a lot in sci-fi. In fact, the same kind of thing gets used in anime a fair bit too. I've been asked to create those kinds of ideas on a couple of music videos and it's actually a lot of fun to mess around with and I'd like to share some techniques to make similar effects here today. Hi, AD Burrows here and this is another bonus video from the Space VFX Elements series by myself and Gleb Alexandrov. For those of you who have the course, I've included these extra wormhole varieties as blend files for you. In this video, we'll be heavily relying on procedural animation techniques, also a whole lot of procedural cycles texturing that works great in real time. So let's get strapped in and make it so. Alright, so let's start with some scene setup stuff. We'll be using cycles rendering and I'm just going to left click and drag to split the view here. Let's switch one of these to a node editor. The faithful cube, we shall not be needing, so I'm going to delete that with the X key. The camera, I do want that one, but I'll put it at the center of the world, so Alt G to clear out any transforms and Alt R to clear out any rotations. I'm just going to orient the screen so the X axis is running left to right. Now I'm going to be switching over from CPU to GPU. And because of that, I want to come down to the performance area and switch the tile sizes much higher. So I'm going to set that to 512. That'll speed up our rendering. We want to keep that low if you don't have the GPU option though. Start resolution, I'm going to set that up to 256 so that when we're in rendered view, the first things that Cycles tries to show us isn't quite so blocky. This whole technique is going to depend heavily on emission shaders. So if we come down to light paths, we can set our bounces down to zero. We don't need any of this stuff either. I'm just going to go for a really basic scene. The sampling also doesn't need to be very high, so I'm just going to set those both down to one. And now we can introduce our starting geometry, which is going to be shift A, and that will be a cylinder. Let's take a look at our settings here in the tool shelf. And we have a cap fill of N-Gon. I'm just going to set that to nothing. So if we peek down, you can see we've not got any top or bottom to this cylinder now. This is all looking great, but I want it kind of going shooting along the Y axis. So let's go R to rotate, X to rotate around the X axis, and then let's do that 90 degrees and then hit enter. Let's see if we have any materials in our scene and we have this one material. So I'm just going to give that to the cylinder there. And let's call this wormhole mat. And let's in fact rename by double clicking on the cylinder there in the outliner. And we'll call that wormhole cylinder. And now I'm going to split the view again, so I'll left click and drag across to the left. And let's close out that tool shelf with the T key. And let's press 0 on the numpad to jump into that camera. And I'm just going to select on that little dotted line there, and that'll select the camera for us. And let's just scroll the mouse wheel in a little bit just to fill the screen a bit more. And as, as you can see, it's pointing straight down at the moment. And as we did with the cylinder, I'm going to press R and then X and then 90 to rotate that around. So it's sort of looking down the length of this tube here. There's not really much of it that we can see though, so let's press 7 on the numpad to take a look from top view. And I'm going to tab into edit mode, press G and then Y and then 1, just to move them up on this axis. And let's press Z to toggle the wireframe, A to deselect everything, B to border select and left click and drag across all those vertices there. And let's scroll out a little bit and let's just make this, I don't know, about say that long. Let's take a look in our tool shelf to see how far we shoved it there. Almost 12 units, let's just round that off. There's something else to think about. If I tab back into object mode there, just to see it a little clearer. Everything is very faceted looking at the moment. So I'm just going to scroll down here, set our shading to smooth. But we're actually looking at the, the backside of the faces that we've got here. So let's press N to toggle the properties window here. And if I scroll down, we can see under our shading area, we have back face culling. I'm just going to select that on. And that shows us that all the faces we actually want are pointing outwards. So I'm, let's tab into edit mode, select everything with A. Might need to do that a couple of times if you've got something selected already. Let's go Control F and then bring up our faces menu. Flip normals is right at the top. So I'm just going to select that and then tab back into object mode. Let's press Z in this 3D view as well and we can rotate around. And we don't have back face culling on in this view. So let's press N and come down to the shading area again and set that there. N to close that out again. Something else we can do is just select the camera and come over to the camera settings and the focal length of this can be a lot lower and it kind of gives the impression that the end of the tube, the end of our wormhole as it were, was way, way, way in the distance. So that can be a kind of a reasonable effect. I'm just going to set this somewhere around 20 though for now. 
Now the next thing I'm going to do is select this cylinder again and let's select to use nodes and we can scroll in and just take a look at this a little bit clearer and you'll notice if I go to select the camera we no longer see the material we're working on for the cylinder so let's select this cylinder again and just hit this little pin icon so if we are dealing with other objects sometimes we can still select the camera but our material for that cylinder stays intact where it is so we can still make tweaks. So let's reselect the cylinder. I'm going to get rid of this property sidebar because we're going to get the walls kind of closing in on us here. So left click and drag across here and we'll change this to an image editor. And what we want to do now is unwrap this cylinder. So let's tab into edit mode with our cylinder and taking a look in the UV and image editor here, you can see that there aren't any UVs. Now we could have actually simplified things for ourselves since when we first created a mesh cylinder, we could have again set that to nothing and just simply generate UVs. And now if we tab into edit mode, you can see there's all the UVs there for us, completely done and it's incredibly fast. But if we were to now, for some reason, want to preserve what we had before, instead of now setting up this one instead, what we can do is just select our cylinder, shift select this cylinder with the UV map that we do want on it. And then we can just press control L. At the bottom of our make links menu there, we have transfer UV maps. And now if we select this cylinder that we had and tab into edit mode, there's all the UVs. So that was nice and easy, but I'm going to actually undo that with Control Z. In fact, let's undo a few steps so we have that second cylinder there out of our scene. And let's take a look at another way of being able to do this. Let's get you tooled up with some more UV techniques. Let's go tab into edit mode and then press U. And then we have here cylinder projection, which looks wild and crazy at first. Let's go up to our other settings though and change that to align to object. And it's almost looking all right, but let's get this a little bit further and select scale to bounds. And now this is exactly what we want. In fact, let's take a look at this by scrolling over a little bit further. Press N to open up the property sidebar, zoom out slightly, and then just select one of these vertices. And you can see its position is at 0, 256. And on this side, it's 256 by 256. This is a default 0 to 256 grid, basically. Now, if we don't like it like that, we can actually just set the coordinates to be normalized instead. And now it'll run from zero to one, if that's a little bit more simpler to figure out. But I'm just going to leave this on the 256 by 256 grid. So let's take a look at how we can kind of improve this unwrapping a little bit further. And that's to refine where our edge seam is. It'd be neater if the seam was this edge directly at the bottom. And we want to see where that is on our UVs. So let's keep our UVs and mesh editing in sync by clicking on this button. And you can see it's basically just one off. So let's go control tab, select that face at the end there. And then we want to move that right over there since this edge is going to be where our texture seam is. So let's just put that at the bottom and it's kind of will always be able to quickly identify where that seam is. So all we need to do is G X and then minus 256 and it'll pop it over onto the other side for us. And what's cool about that is we can go control tab, select vertices, select that vertex up over there. And if we press G to move it around, you can see it's all automatically nicely welded. And now let's shift these all over slightly. So let's press A and then A again, to select everything. And we want the center of this to be 128. So let's set that to 128 and it shoves it eight units over. And now we have it all nicely aligned. Now what we want to do is animate these UVs. So what we want is a temporary image that we can play with to just sort of test everything's working out okay and see it zooming along this tube that we've got. So let's click on new. Let's call this just a color grid. And then what we want to do is the generated type that needs to be a color grid. 1024 by 1024 is fine. Let's just click on okay. Now let's just shift these windows over so there's more space on the materials now. And let's go shift A and add in a texture image texture, drop that in. Let's find our color grid from the pull down and let's control shift click this. So it just hooks it up into a viewer node for us, a temporary emission shader basically. And then what we can do, let's try selecting this to be a material shading instead. And let's actually switch it on here as well over to material. Now the, what this is exposed is that everything seems to be mirrored. So let's fix that. Let's pull back over to our UV image editor. And all we need to do is press control M and then let's press X 
and then left click to confirm and there we go. Now another thing that I'd like to do is just at this end where the camera is, I'd like all these to be the lower letters. So let's press A to deselect everything, go shift space to just have a good look at this texture. So at the bottom we've got A1 to A8 on the side and what would be quite cool is to essentially reflect that on our tube. So let's go shift space again, select everything with the A key, plus R and then 180 to just rotate that around. And now our UVs are all properly aligned. Let's get on with the task of animating these. So let's tab back into object mode, come over to our modifiers, add modifier, and the animated UVs is basically called UV warp. And what we're going to need is to tell it what we want to warp from and what we want to warp to. So for that, let's control that with some empties. Let's go shift A, add in an empty, just a plain axis. Let's rename this to wormhole UV warp start. Let's shift D to duplicate that, but let's make this look different and easier to select and change it from the old plane axes. Let's try circle. In fact, that's too confusing with the cylinder opening. Let's try instead a sphere. So now we have this one here, which is the wormhole start and this one, which is going to be the wormhole end. So let's double click that and rename that to end. Let's reselect our UV cylinder and come over back over to the modifiers. And now from is going to be our start and two is going to be our end. And now if we grab our end and let's left click and drag on this Y axis, we now have some animating UVs. Now we want to make this feel like these UVs are moving towards the camera. So let's see which direction we have to move them. We basically just need to shift this empty towards the camera. So that kind of makes sense. So let's press Alt G to reset the transforms there. Press I to insert a location keyframe. And let's switch this one here to a graph editor. And what we want to do actually is we only really need the Y location. So let's select the X location and press X and the Z location, press X. And now we just have this one. Now what we'll do is press N to open up our properties. And here we have our modifiers tab. Let's add a generator modifier. And this is just gonna create an infinite amount of distance for us. Now, right now, there's no point in me playing this because it's gonna be extremely fast. So if we just set this right down to maybe zero, minus 0 0.1, let's press Alt A now and see how that goes. It's a little bit on the fast side. Let's hold Shift and left click in here to scroll it down so it's not quite as brutally quick. And then now let's go Alt A again. And that's a little bit more like we can handle it right now. We can speed this up a little bit later. But now we have this kind of procedural control over how fast we want this to be moving. Now let's go back over to our node editor. And something else that I'd like to clean up in the view is just what layers we have here. And also this lamp. See now we're going to clean up the scene a little bit more. We don't really need that. Let's press X. Let's scroll up here. And in fact, let's go shift space with our cursor in that 3D view. So we can easily see the layers tab. Open that up. Let's hide some empty layers. So right now everything's in the same layer, but what we can do is just have this layer one as just the camera. And then this main wormhole cylinder, let's press M to move that to the second layer instead. Let's turn on the visibility and we'll name that wormhole cylinder. And then the empties for the UV warping, I'm just gonna shift select both of them, press M and then move them to layer three. Turn those on and let's call them UV empties. Now the cool thing about these, it, let's just select one of them, is with this UV animating, we can actually do quite a lot with this. We can just press R and Z, and then we can start rotating the UVs around. We can press S to scale those UVs. And of course, as we've seen, we can press G to move those UVs around. So let's just reset that transform with Alt G, putting our UVs back, and then let's go shift space to minimize the view. And we can see in our camera view here, we have this orange crosshair. Those are our empties basically. And that might make things a little bit cluttered that don't really need to be. So let's just shift select the other one in the outliner. Now we've got them both empties selected. It doesn't really matter where we move these as long as we move them both together. It's not gonna affect the position of our UVs. So let's go G, X and three, just to move it three units along the X axis. And now we can still select the other one and then move that and that's kind of going to behave exactly as we expect since our keyframe is only going to affect the y-axis anyway so if we shift left arrow it should just snap back to where it needs to be anyway okay so our wormhole at the moment is a bit on the boring side we have this just linear progression straight into the center of the screen and if we had to plunge into the abyss we might as well make it interesting to look at so we want all these bends and twists and turns and stuff 
So to do that, we're going to use an armature to deform our cylinder with. So let's go Shift A and add in an armature single bone. Let's go RX negative 90 to lay it on its side like the cylinder is. And if we select the cylinder, press N to come up with the property sidebar. And you can see that the dimensions of that Z axis is 14 units. So it's 14 units long there. Let's go Shift Space so we've got a little bit more view. And if I select the armature, press 7 on the numpad to take a look from top orthographic view. We can then press tab to tab into edit mode and we can lift this all the way up to match the same height as the cylinder. In fact, we can just round that off to 14 exactly. Now we don't want one bone, we want three altogether. So I'm going to press W to bring up the specials menu, hit subdivide. And instead of just the two bones, we want three. So I'm going to up the cuts there. And now I'm going to grab the bottom of this section and then drag that down and then grab the top of this and drag that up. And if we want a little bit more precision, we can just round these off. So let's set that to 13 and then this bit down here, let's set that to one. Now I'm going to select this middle bone and let's go shift space to break open our properties window over here. Let's come over to the armature settings and we want this to be displayed as a B bone setup. And let's come over to the bone tab and then let's increase the amount of segments we have in our bendy bones area here. In fact, let's go crazy with this. Let's go something like 24. So I'm just going to pull the difference between these windows down a little bit and just stretch this over here a touch. All right. So with this, let's enter into our pose mode, select this top bone and press G to move it around. And you can see it sticks into the position because it's still attached to the middle bone. So let's go back into edit mode. And with that top bone selected, I'm going to go Alt P and then clear the parent. And now when we go into pose mode again, we can press G and now this moves independently. But we still want this one to kind of twist and turn pointing at that top bone since we'll animate this top bone and we just want the rest to be calculated for us. So with this middle bone selected, let's come over to the bone constraints, add a bone constraint. Let's choose the stretch to find our armature. And then now we have a problem because we don't know what bone is what. So what we can do and what we should do really is grab these bones, this one at the bottom. I'm going to call the base, this one in the middle. Let's call this bendy, no mistaking that. And then let's go at the top, maybe call that the head. So now with this middle bone selected, let's select the head to be the bone to stretch to. And now when we select this, we can press G and it seems to be working. But if we take a look at this and press G, move this over here, it's not exactly very smooth as it comes into it. There is something we can do about that. We can select our middle bone again and come over to the bone settings, middle click and drag down a little bit more, use our custom handle references, and we can choose the base and the head as it's in and out points. And now it's looking a lot more smooth. So let's select that and go Alt G, reset the transform on it. And now we want that kind of behavior to deform our cylinder, our wormhole that we have here. The problem with this particular cylinder at the moment, if we tab into edit mode to take a look, is that we've just got some vertices at one end and some vertices at the other and nothing really else to deform and twist and bend in between. So we could add an extra load of loops with control R and uh, let's do that. Let's go control R and then we can use our middle mouse wheel to increase the amount of segments that we want. But let's assume that we didn't exactly know how many segments we wanted. So we want to keep this kind of as procedural as possible. So let's scroll down to just be one extra edge loop for now and left click and drag that in. And instead of moving anything, let's just right click and cancel that transform. So one modifier that we could use to do this is a subdivide modifier. But as well as subdividing that central edge there, it's actually going to subdivide all the edges going around the cylinder as well, which is not really geometry I think we need. So there's going to be a lot of wasted geometry there basically. So let's come over to our modifiers and choose instead a bevel modifier. Now currently that's doing the same problem. It's going to bevel every single edge. So instead of that, let's middle click and drag down and set this to be weight instead. And now it's only going to bevel anything with a weight value above zero. So let's middle click and drag up on our property sidebar, find our edges data. And we're just going to set the edges that we have selected in the middle there to one. Now it doesn't look like much has happened at the moment, but if we tab into object mode, press Z to toggle the wireframe and let's come over to the display area of our object data tab. And then let's come down and select the wire and draw all edges. Let's come back over to the modifier 
And here's our one segment of beveling that we've done in the middle here. We can set that to two or three and only our weighted edges get beveled. What we want though is instead of them bunched up here, we want them evenly spread across the whole length. Now, thankfully, because this is so simple geometry, it's actually pretty easy to do. Instead, what we can do is set this to percent and then we can turn off our clamp overlap, in fact, and then let's set this to say 50%. It'll spread our edges so that they make it 50% of the way to those edges that we have at either end of our cylinder. So if we set that instead to 100%, it's going to spread it across everything. That means we're getting some overlapping geometry at either end, which we'll see if we take the amount down below 100. That overlapping won't affect us, but I thought it was worth pointing it out just to get a better understanding of the modifier. Now we have control over how many edges are evenly spread across the length of the cylinder. Let's try 32 for example. And in fact we can left click and drag and just increase or decrease the amount of loops that we want down the edge of this cylinder to be anything we want. So again I'm just going to set that down to 32 for the moment. And now we have enough geometry to be deformed by the armature. So with the cylinder selected I'll then shift select the armature and go control P and select armature deform with automatic weights. That means when we select our cylinder again, we come over to our data tab and you can see we have these three vertex groups auto generated, base, bendy and head. It's fairly straightforward to see what's also happened with these vertex groups if you switch to weight painting mode. You can see that this bendy bone has got full strength of everything, that's why it's red. The base and the head though have got absolutely zero control over anything, shown by this blue color. So what we want to do is tab into edit mode, alt right click this end edge loop here and with the head selected there we want to give that full weight and the same at the bottom, alt right click this and with the base there we want to select assign to make that 100%. Now again we could just go into weight painting and then go through here, the base now looks like this. Bendy's still got full control over everything and head has now got control over the vertices on that end. So let's go into object mode, select our armature, which is in pose mode already. Select that top head bone there and press G and move around and you can see the cylinder is now behaving just as we want it. Now if we squeeze this in, you can kind of see that the, the diameter of the cylinder is actually changing because it's trying to preserve the volume. Now I'd like to switch that feature off. So let's go over to our stretch constraint, which should show once we select the bendy bone and then we'll switch the volume setting here to none. And let's select that top head bone again and see if that has fixed it. And it looks like it has. And now all we need to do is just give this top bone a little bit of animation data and that should provide all the twisting and everything that we need. All right, so let's get organizing just before we do this. Let's go back to object mode and let's put this armature by pressing M onto layer four. And then layer four pops up in our layer list there. Let's give this a name, armature. Not much of a surprise there. Let's turn back on that layer, the visibility of it. And let's go back into pose mode. And what we can do now is just give ourselves a little bit more space on this side. I'm just gonna clean up the view with N and T there and zoom in on here. Let's control the middle mouse just to get a bit more precise on the border there. Let's in fact select this camera border, come over to the camera settings, come over to the passepartout setting where we can set the darkness of this surround here. So let's turn that up to maybe about there. And then of course, if we select our armature, it's kind of in the way. So let's set the armature settings to say wire instead. And um, then we should be able to get away with selecting our top head bone there, pressing G, and then we can kind of see what's going on. In fact, let's do one more thing. Let's press N to bring up the display properties sidebar, and then let's take it to only render and press N to close that again. And it's a much, much cleaner now. So what we could do with this is just manually go for it. So press I, let's say move it into a position, I should say, and then press I to insert a keyframe, move forward a few more frames, press G, and then maybe we wanted it there. And this kind of thing, that's perfectly fine. That's a very, very cool way to go about it and gives you tons of control, obviously. But let's just try a more procedural way of going about things. So let's press Alt G to clear out the transform of that top bone and we'll give ourselves a little bit more space down below. And I'm gonna give ourselves a bit more space in this window. So let's switch over to a graph editor. We've got no keyframes on this at the moment. So let's press I to insert a location keyframe. And let's open up the head bone that we've got there. And we've got keyframes for X, Y, and Z. Let's go down to the modifiers tab and currently we'll have the X location selected. Let's pull this out a little bit further and we can add a noise modifier. 
And now instead of it just being a flat line giving us the value of zero, we've got this shaky noisy value. So let's press Alt A and see what we've done. Well, basically we seem to have just made it shiver quite a lot. So we don't really quite want that sort of effect, but what we can do is increase our scale and that will slow things down since the X axis along here is gonna be our timeline. And then the strength should give us stronger and more wider array of values to switch between. So let's go Alt A again and see how far we're pushing things. So let's go up to one of these top peaks here. So I'm just gonna left click and drag about there. And let's just keep on increasing the strength until we get around about where we want it yeah so you can see the little gizmo still shows up and that's probably about right in fact i'll go a little bit higher than that still okay so let's just round that off to 30 just to make things a little bit nice and neat so is it the right kind of speed that it's doing this though let's try again alt a and it maybe is a little bit fast so let's take the scale up even further press alt a again and that's looking okay. Now what we'll do is come over to this little button over here, copy our X position settings, which is going side to side. We now want to give it some up and down values, which is our Z axis. So we're going to come over to the Z axis and we'll paste that in. In fact, while we're here, we'll just take the Y location and let's delete it since we don't really need that. So with that now, we have an X location and a Z location. But you'll notice that the, the curves are exactly the same and we don't really want that. So on the Z location, I'm going to alter the phase of this so that we get some completely unique noise pattern happening there. And now let's press Alt A again and see what we've got. And I think that's looking pretty cool. And it's really easy to just tweak our settings here and get unique and varied results. Okay, for the material, this is a technique that has the sort of result that you see actually quite a lot. With this basic idea, you can do a lot of those manga-like streaks that you get behind characters. In fact, I've done this sort of thing on music videos in the past. All you need is a nice image, anything really. You could take a cloudy looking image from online. Like here, I'm just browsing the clouds results on Pixabay. Or you can try taking a pretty colorful shot from the Nebula fly-through tutorial that we've done. Once we've got that image, we just need to make it seamless. A fairly pain-free way of doing that is just to take it into GIMP and then go Filter, Map, Make Seamless, and that's it. All we have to do is export out our image and then we've got it. And if it's needed, I'll include the image that I'm using here as a download for you to use if you want to. So let's bring our seamless cloudy texture into Blender. Let's switch this window over to a node editor. Let's go Shift A and add in a texture, image texture. Drop that in there, go to open, navigate to the Nebula render tiles image, open that up, let's control shift click on it, and we can immediately see it in the view. Let's press Alt A and take a look. And now it looks like we're flying through something. So this could be a bit more impressive, I think. So let's select on it, go control T, and that will auto generate these texture coordinates and mapping node for us. That is if you have the node wrangler add-on enabled. And now from here, what we can do is we can actually stretch out one of the axes. So we can kind of push that up if we want it to tile a little bit more frequently, or we can switch it down to make it stretch right out, which is a little bit more like what you get with those manga lines, which are quite common. Thing is, this is the slowest anime hero zoom or wormhole fly through I've ever seen put to the screen. So let's close out this image. We don't really need it now. Let's left click and drag into it to collapse it. I'm just gonna lift this up a little bit and we can lift this up a little bit as well. And let's switch this to a graph editor at the bottom. Since if we just go over and select our warp start or warp end, I should say, we have our Y location there. Let's press N to bring up the modifiers tab. So let's click on that, scroll down. And then this is basically controlling our speed. So let's set that up by holding shift and left click and drag on it. I'm gonna take that down to about 0.08 or nine. And now let's press Alt A again. And now we've got something that looks a little bit cooler. So there's loads of things that we can obviously do with this as we could do with any node. Let's border select across with B, press G to move them across there. And what we could do is maybe add in a hue and saturation. I'm just gonna take the saturation down a little bit, maybe tweak the hue as well, maybe push it a bit more into the blues. And what we could also do is add in a color RGB curves node and drop that in and we could maybe increase the contrast a little bit. Let's go Alt A again. And so you can see we could get lots of different styles even with this one image. Now what I'm actually going to do is set this up a little bit higher so that we get a little bit more detail and resolution that we can see on this. Let's go Alt A and we can see it's not as streaky but we're getting a lot more sort of clumps of high detail frequency noise going on. And what I'll do also is 
come over to select the camera and then let's take the focal length even further down let's kind of really quite distort the geometry that is very close to the lens here so let's take it down to around 10 and press alt a again and that's also creating a smaller hole at the end for us so let's press alt a and we can maybe tweak the scale a little bit further maybe try taking that up a little bit more or maybe just keeping it a little bit lower and I think about that is a kind of a happy medium so with that we've kind of got our base for which to build the rest of the textures on all right so at this point I think we need to talk about the end we need to see what we're actually going to be plunging into so if we go alt a you can see we've got this little bit of color at the end which is just the color of the 3d view gradient at the moment let's press n to bring up our property sidebar and set that to be the world background instead now we have this dark gray color let's go over to the world tab and click on our color swatch for that and now we have our decision so we want to go optimistically into the light at the end of the tunnel or we want to plunge ourselves into the deepest darkest depths of some kind so what we could do i mean one way to use this kind of effect is to make it look like whatever it is where the camera is placed there's kind of a light emitting from that we could have that and then we have a gradient which goes off into black or we could set that similarly just going into white and it looks like there's some light that we're going into either way it kind of depends on your state of mind i suppose so I'm going to choose the more light at the end of the tunnel sort of option. So let's get setting that up. So first of all, we have this base layer already. Let's press B, left click and drag across them. Shift P to add them into a frame. N to bring up our properties and we can name this now. I'll just call that base layer. Let's press N again to close that. And what I like to do is operate in the node editor a little bit like you might in a 2D layer stack. So I'm going to put that at the bottom and then we're going to build our elements on top. So this element that we're putting in now is pretty much our final layer, but it's nice to kind of bookend everything what we do in between with the major elements here. So let's go shift A and add in our texture gradient. Enough talk, let's get on with it. All right, so we have our gradient texture, control T to generate our vector nodes, control shift click on this to take a look. So this is pretty effective, uh, but we have some nice clean UVs that have been set up. So let's switch to those instead. And it's wrapping around the wrong way at the moment. We wanna rotate this, but that brings us to another point. And that's the fact that we have our UVs on this cylinder. Let's come over to them. We have a UV map and they're actually being warped by the modifier so if we come over to the modifiers and select our uv map warp and come back over to our uv maps and what we want to do is not obviously have this gradient sort of zooming down constantly instead what we want is to have another uv map which is just going to be a duplicate of that one and now we'll go uv map underscore static this one won't move because the modifier is warping this one instead it's going to leave that one alone so let's get rid of this texture coordinate node we don't want that instead we want to go shift a and add in our input uv map because we want to specify exactly which uv map we want to use and we want to use the uv map static so let's plug that in and also just to be clear let's go shift s on this and switch the type of this node to the input uv map also and we'll switch the uv map warp this time so that's all nicely cleaned up now what we want to do is rotate this around and I think we need to go negative 90. Let's take a look in this view as well and you can kind of see what's happening. Let's take a look from the top orthographic view with seven on the numpad. Let's press N to bring up our property sidebar. I'm just going to set this to display only render as well just to clean up the view a bit. So we can see it starts at black on one end and then it goes to white towards the other. Now what we could do is just shift A and add in a color invert and drop that in. And now we have a toggle in case we do want to plunge into black instead. But I'm gonna set that down to zero and we'll not really use this node. I'm gonna mute it in fact, but with the M key. All right, so now what we wanna do is go shift A and add in a color mix RGB node. Let's drop that in. And now let's hook these up so that we have kind of the beginnings of our layer stack. Let's grab all these with the B key, shift P, and then press N to bring up the property sidebar. Let's call this the end gradient. And we've got everything we need here, but we of course don't have our base layer. So we're gonna add this gradient on top of everything else. So let's switch that to add. And we want that in the second socket. And now we want this in our first socket. And we're gonna add it all the way. Now let's press Alt A and we can see we now get this fade into the very bright light at the end. Now what I like to do is just control the fall off of that fade. So let's go Shift A converter 
math, drop that in. Let's put that into our frame. Set the calculation to be power. And now what we can do is control this a little bit and we can see what's happening in this view. We're basically pushing it away from the camera really and just having that little bit of bright light at the end. So with that, I think we are done with our end gradient. Let's just grab these guys, press G and move them right up. And now we've got some space for some more layers here. So let's add in some long streaky speedy lines going along our wormhole here. Let's zoom in a little bit. And what we can do is just, first of all, steal a couple of these guys. Let's select UV map and the mapping nodes, Shift D to duplicate them, move them up. Alt P to unparent them from that base layer frame there. And then let's go Shift A and add in a texture, noise texture. This should be a pretty simple setup really. Let's plug this in, Control Shift click it a couple of times so we get our grayscale output. Let's now go Alt A to take a look and we can see we've got our noise hurtling towards the camera there. It's not very streaky yet though, so let's take our scale value. I'm gonna hold Shift and drag that down towards zero. And I think somewhere around 0.1 should do the trick. And let's go and make this a little bit more noticeable by cranking the contrast. I'm gonna use a color RGB curves to do that. Let's drag this bottom left point here towards the middle. So we're basically gonna turn anything that was mid gray and below into complete black. And then also the lighter side of things we can brighten up by just bringing in the other side like this. So let's go Alt A again, and we get these sorts of things swirling towards the camera now. Now it's a little bit misty and not very defined whatsoever. So let's take up our detail to something like five. And now we get a little bit more high frequency between those larger shapes. There's a couple of things we can do at this point. We can kind of create a lot more interest by taking up the scale. So something like 20, as you can see. Or if I bring that back down to say five or four, we can actually set up the distortion as well and that is going to do something quite similar to taking the scale up. The difference is here is that when we introduce this sort of stuff you kind of get these looping sort of shapes which I think are quite cool rather than just long streaks. Uh, if you don't like that though just take the distortion down to zero and up the scale instead. But now let's combine this with what we had. So let's go shift A add in a color mix RGB node drop that in there so now we have this in the first layer, which we don't really want. So let's bring this into the first socket instead, which should move that one into the second. Now, if we take this up to mix all the way, then obviously we're only gonna get what's happening in the second layer. But if we take this and make that add, Again, it's kind of working, but I'd like to try and preserve the coloring a little bit better. It doesn't sit properly, really. So one of the brightening add modes we could try is dodge, and that should sort of sit it in a little bit nicer. And let's go Alt-A to see this hurtling towards us now. And that's looking pretty cool. All right, so let's clean this up slightly. Let's go shift space on it. And then this one wants to now go in the top there. And now let's just tuck this in a little bit. And now that's all layered up properly. So let's control shift click this one, shift space again to minimize the view and go Alt A. And now we can see we get the various different layers that we have now, the three layers so far working together. One last thing I'm going to do is press B to border select across those. And let's just press B and middle click across that because I don't want to include that in my selection. And then just go Shift P, add in that frame, and let's call these long streaks. Close out the property sidebar with the N key again. And then I'm going to grab these two here, press G and move them up. And now we have a little bit more space for some more texture shenanigans. All right, so let's create some pulsating energy rings of light that kind of hurtled towards us here. So let's go and add that in. Let's try this with a texture wave texture. Let's drop that in there and we want our UV coordinates. So let's go input UV map, find our warping UVs and hook those up. Let's go control shift and click on this. And right now, if we go alt A, it's kind of a crazy psychedelic, interesting thing happening, which is pretty intense, uh, which might actually work really well as a, one of the texture elements, but we're just kind of keep things simple and remove the spiral nature of this. And so what we can do to do that is create a vector mapping node and drop it in here. And if we just play with our Y axis here and set that to about 45 degrees, we get our rings. So let's go alt A again. And it's kind of difficult to see what on earth is happening there which is in itself again kind of an interesting effect but what we'll do is set our scale right down to say something like one and let's go alt a again it's slow enough to make out what's actually happening now 
So at the moment, it looks more like just black rings rather than the white tighter rings that we want. So let's go Shift A and add in a converter math node to do that and set this to power as we did before. And then if we set this above one, we can kind of start to decrease the amount of size of the white areas. So let's go Alt A and boom, we have our right white bright light. Now we have the scale here, uh, which is going to do something a little bit similar to what the scale here would do. But what I'm going to do is just keep things simple, set these to one. You can kind of get subtly different results here, especially once you introduce the distortion. And that's what we're going to do right now. Let's take this down a little bit further though, 0 0.5. And now I'm going to up the distortion. So I'm going to set that to about two. And the type of distortion is dependent on these two values. So let's set our detail up to say something like five. And let's play with this a little bit more, maybe take that up to about 10. So we have some weird seams here, but we can always correct this later on if we need to. So let's take another look with Alt A. And that's looking pretty good. Let's see this now in relationship with all the other layers that we've got. So let's take this mix RGB node, shift D to duplicate, let's drop it in there. And actually we want this layer beneath to be the first layer, that one to be the second. And then similarly up here, this one needs to be the first and this layer itself here needs to be the second. So that's all set up correctly now. And let's go Alt A and take a look. All right, so that's looking pretty good. At the moment, it's a bit blown out though. So what I'm gonna do is try and introduce more gray values by taking this lower and closer to one. So we're getting something which is spreading out there a little bit, which is okay. Let's take it down to say something like eight. And that's looking okay. I think what we need to do is just back the value of how much we're dodging onto this. So let's try 0 0.95. And now we're getting a lot more detail and it's not quite as blown out. So let's go Alt A again and let's just take a look. And yeah, I think that should do the trick. So let's zoom out a little bit, border select across all of these, B and middle click across that. And just make sure it's just these nodes that we can shift P to add into our frame. Let's call this pulses. Let's create some mid frequency noise now, just a little something for our eyes to anchor onto in these larger, softer forms. So I think this should be pretty easy since we've got a lot of the elements we need already. For example, in this long streaks should do it. So I'm gonna press B to border select across those and then shift D to duplicate them, move them up. In fact, we need to make a little bit of space. So I'm gonna border select across these at the top, lift that up, grab our long streaks again, and then bring them into position. And to open up the property sidebar, let's change this to mid frequency noise. All right, let's control shift click on it. There's our long streaks. Those long streaks are coming from this mapping node, the Y axis scale value, which we don't really need now. So let's control X to delete it while maintaining the node connection between these two. And it's very distorted at the moment. We don't need that. Let's just set that to zero. And then we're pretty much there. I think what we'll do is just add in a converter math node at the end, set that to power. And now we've got some nice control over our fall off, especially once we raise this above one. So let's take that to about there. What I'd like to do with this is have more patches of light generally going on. So I'm going to turn the scale up to something around 12. So something like that. And these blown out areas, I'm just going to reduce a bit by taking this little white point on the far right of the RGB curves and just back that off a little bit. In fact, overall, I think I'm going to bring in more grayscale values by pulling this one at the bottom further to the left. And now what really what we need to do is see this in context. So let's grab a mix RGB node, shift D to duplicate it, bring that to the side of this mid frequency noise frame. And then let's bring that into the first socket, we should bump that into the second. And then let's put this into position by replacing the first socket there. And let's control shift click on the very end. So now we have all elements working together. I'm actually gonna set this to one and really control how much brightness is coming into here with this little point on the far right here. But for the most part, I think we're getting a lot of nice little details coming through. So for example, what's really cool about this setup, it's quite easy to just grab the node at the end and press M to mute it. And you can see the difference that that layer is making. So let's go Alt A and take a look at it in action. And yeah, I think that's all we need to this mid frequency noise. I think that's kind of sitting in quite well. Let's introduce some star streaks into this, kind of almost like little points of light that have been stretched because of some kind of motion blur. Clearly with this sort of technique, we're gonna struggle with introducing any actual motion blur. So we're kind of gonna fake it a little bit with this particular texture. And it's very similar to the long streaks really. So let's use that as a base. Let's border select across them with the B key, shift D to duplicate them. Let's bring them to the top. And uh, we don't want that in there. Let's go Alt P, pop that back out. 
And this stuff up at the top, let's border select across those with the B key, give ourselves a little bit more space. This is going to be one of the final elements now. What we want to do is control shift click on this. I'm going to reset this all to one though. So left click and drag across them all, put that to one, take the distortion down to zero, the detail back down to two. And instead of manipulating the Y value, this time I'm going to increase the X value. And I'm going to take that up to something around 8.5. And I'm now going to crunch in the leftmost point on this RGB curves and take that up to around 0.6 or so. And now we have our little stars that have streaked across. We can control a bit of this with the scale factor. So let's maybe take that up to something like 20. And I'm also going to back this off a little bit on here. Fade these out a little bit more like this. And now let's see these in context. So let's go shift space to go full screen since we're getting very vertical here. And shift D to duplicate this one, drop that in there. Again, simply as we've done before, this one goes into the top socket and this one goes into the top socket. So let's control shift click on the final layer, shift space to take a look in our rendered camera. And now we can see all our little streaks showing in. In fact, if we wanna just see the difference, we can just select our node at the end there, press M to toggle what they look like before and after. And of course we've got long streaks still. Let's rename that to be star streaks. And we can control kind of how bright some of these are with this right point on our RGB curves. And I think maybe about there seems to be a decent sweet spot. So let's take a look at this in action with Alt A. And I think we're just about done with the major elements. So far, we've been reaping the benefits of the material viewport shading, which is essentially giving us a dutiful and unflinching representation in real time of our material setup. In fact, if we uncheck only render here and take a look at our frames per second in the top left there, it's actually hitting it pretty nicely. Let's come over to our rendering tab, set that up to say 30 instead, and it's still managing to hit that with no issue. And if we come up to 50 frames per second, it's pretty much being maxed out at 40 frames per second or so, which is pretty good. Setting that back to 24 frames per second, let's take a look in rendered view and cue sad trombone. Things aren't quite looking how they should, but this is actually pretty cool on its own, but it's not really the effect that we're going for, but it does give us a good opportunity to talk about how some of these nodes work. So the majority of what we're looking at here, which has gone wrong, is coming from our star streaks. So I'm just gonna mute that here, and now it cleans it up a whole lot. So really all this is, is it's just values outside of zero and one coming out of the RGB curves. And you really get a whole lot of those when you squeeze things in on either side like we have here. It's really easy to fix though, if we just bring this out and go and add in a color ramp node at the end, this is essentially gonna clamp the values coming out of here between zero and one. And now if we go to rendered view, Oh, in fact, if we just unmute that with the M key, you can see in rendered view, it's actually totally fine. And in material view, it's very, very similar now. So some of you might be thinking, what on earth was the point in doing that? Because this node right here could do the job of this one perfectly fine. Well, basically, I just like to start with these RGB curves because I never know whether I'm really gonna go for color for starters. And this color ramp is only gonna give us grayscale values, despite what this little yellow node is trying to trick us into. The other issue is that we have things like the factor slider here. And if we wanted to, we could introduce curves into this. I'm just gonna undo that with Control Z though. And since we're not actually using any of those benefits, we might as well just swap this out now. So what we've got here on this second point is 0.778. So I'm gonna select this second point here and set that to 0.778. This one on the far left is 0.615. So let's select this one on the left, 0.615. And now if we actually just take this out and put that into the second socket, and instead of taking the out of this RGB curves, we take the factor out of the noise texture like this, we can now easily compare the two. With the RGB curves, we're getting this. And now with this color ramp node, we're getting exactly the same. All right, so we can delete that RGB curves node and we can sit that back in. And we've got our long streaks down here, which is gonna give us something similar. So let's just mute this one. And now let's take a look in rendered view and material view. And that's pretty much identical now. What we'll do is, first of all, just add in the color ramp towards the end. And as I say, we could just leave it at that because now the values are gonna be clamped between zero and one. But since we're not using it any curves, we're not using any color, and we're not really using this factor slider, now's the time to swap this over. So let's undo that point and select this one on the left, 0.5, that's pretty easy. Let's set that one to 0.5. And this one on the right, 
uh, this one needs to be about 0 0.699. In fact, let's just call that 0 0.7. And now again, let's just do our little test just to prove this. Take this one going into here and take the factor out of this instead to go into the color ramp. Unmute our dodge node there. And let's take a look at the differences here. Absolutely none. And let's take a look now in our rendered view and switch that back to material view and you can see it's identical again. So now we can take our RGB curves and delete it. So with that, we're back on track and we can add just one final element, which is a bit of a nice to have, but maybe not essential. I'll leave it down to you as to whether you wanna include it or not. But what I'm gonna do is just grab these final two nodes up here and just give ourselves space to just add one more thing. So let's try some Fresnel on this basically, some brightening at the glancing angles on this geometry as far as our camera sees it. So let's go shift A and add in an input layer weight node and drop that in. So we have our Fresnel output, but we also have this facing output, which I think has a kind of a longer and smoother gradient from our lights to darks. So let's control shift click this to see what we've got. There we have our brightening on the glancing angles happening. And what we could do with this is now control it a little bit better with this math node set to power, which again, as we've done before, is just gonna control our fall off. So if we set this up, we kind of get more brightness and then we can kind of clamp that in if we like, or we can bring this back. Now it's possible you may be thinking sometimes, why not just use a color ramp on this? Let's just set that up to something like around here. So if we wanted to say clamp it off into the blacks into around here, and we wanted to achieve that with a color ramp, we can plug that in and give it a try. But I think you'll probably see that it feels like a nicer, smoother gradient when we have our power node doing that sort of job. So anyway, I'm gonna delete that with the X key and let's take a look at this really in context. So let's duplicate one of these, Shift D to duplicate it and just drop it in. And then this one can go in the first socket and then the always go in the first socket of the one above them. So let's do that again. And let's control shift click this final node. And we can see we do get a little bit of brightening around the edges there. Let's try a slightly different area. So let's kind of make that a little bit larger, a little bit more pronounced. So I'm not gonna clamp it in quite as far. So let's take that down to say something like three. And I think that might probably just about do it. Don't wanna to go too extreme on the effect. It's almost like it's getting white hot due to the tension of whatever is happening in this thing. I might actually just set the size of it down maybe a little bit. It's mostly going to be a bit of a push and pull between these two nodes for your personal tastes. So let's just label this up, even though there's not much to label, just these two nodes. Shift P, once we've selected them, let's just call that edge highlight. Let's go shift space on the node window just to maximize the view there. And we've got a few nodes down here that we don't really need. I'm gonna delete those two and keep the color grid that we had around though. We might need that. And let's border select across with the B key on the final nodes and let's raise them up a bit closer to our end node in the chain there. And talking of that actually, let's put one more in here just to treat the whole thing. Let's go RGB curves, drop that in. Let's go shift space, take a look at what we're doing here. And basically, if we go Alt A, we can use this to affect the coloring quite a bit. So let's bump up the red channel, for example, and we can get kind of a completely different tone and feel to it. I'm gonna offset that bump in the red channel by just dropping the whole thing down a bit, something like this. And I think that's looking pretty cool. So the major aspects of this material are pretty much in place. We have the end gradient, the edge highlights. We've got things like the mid-frequency noise, long streaks, and down at the bottom here, the base layer. Ah, the good old days where we had our nebula image and we spent the time, energy, and patience putting that into a 2D image editor and making it seamless. Let's control shift, click on that. And there's our seamlessness in all of its glory. But if we come up to where our procedural texturing begins and control shift click our long streaks, you can see we didn't really afford this the same kind of opportunities. At the bottom there, occasionally it's quite noticeable. You can really see a kind of a nasty seam there. And people may have been screaming at the screens about this since nearly the beginning. So uh, let's save some vocal cords out there and get this fixed. So all we wanna do is create a mask really. So we want a nice little smooth gradient at the bottom there. And then we'll use that to mix between two different noise textures. So let's go shift A and add an input UV map. And let's just choose the UV map static from the list. Let's go and add in also a texture gradient texture, plug those in. Let's control shift click this. And that's basically what we want, but we want to remap this. So we'll use a color ramp to do that. Let's drop that in. And so we can add in an extra point and make this point at the far right a black color so that it now goes from black to mid gray background to black again. 
So let's make our mid gray actually white. And since we only want to mix away just the bottom area there, I'm actually going to crunch this over to the side, maybe 0.1, add another point, take that to 0.9 and actually make sure that that is full white again. And now we have our mask. Let's border select across these with the B key, shift P and let's call that mask. And let's just move that off to the side slightly. So let's give our mask something to do. We want to blend between two noise textures. So let's create the space to make that happen. Let's bring these up here and this color ramp out here. Here's our noise texture and the two nodes that we need with it. So let's go shift D, duplicate them, move them down. Let's go shift A and add in a color mix RGB node. Here's our magical node, which is going to do the mixing. Let's take the color out at first and plug that into the bottom socket. And now let's get our mask and put that into action into the factor. All right, so let's control shift click on this. And now we can see the majority of this is quite colorful and then it blends into black and white right at the bottom where our mask is making that happen. So we know we've got it working here. I'm actually just gonna flip these around though. So I'm gonna left click and drag to swap those. So that this stuff on top is the majority and this stuff at the bottom is the fix. And also while we're here, let's make sure we take the grayscale output before we forget. And so now these are very equivalent but we still, of course, have our seam since the seam here is the very edges of our UV map. So if we tab into edit mode, let's break open our trusty UV map image editor. Let's find that there. And if we control tab to select our edges and alt right click the side there, there's our seam clearly running down the center at the bottom. And what we want to do is we need a new UV map. So let's click on the plus icon, call this warp offset. Let's go control tab, switch back to face select mode. And I'm going to try and press B to border select across the right hand half of faces there, which it looks like I've got. And now let's take a look at our coordinates by pressing the N key. Here's our coordinates up here. I'm going to switch this to normalize just because we can. And then let's just go G X minus one to basically move it one full unit across to the left. So it's still going to tile. So now where our seam was is right now in the middle. So let's press A to deselect, A to select everything, and then G X 0.5 to move it halfway across, which should place it exactly where we want it. I'm going to take the normalized off now though. Tab back into object mode, close that window by left click dragging into it. And then what we can do now is find our UV map node and switch that to UV map warp offset. And we've now blended away our troubles. There is a little issue with this, of course, if we go Alt A to animate it, uh, we don't actually have anything moving there. That's just a static UV map since our UV warp modifier is only concerned with this particular UV map. So what we're going to need to do is add another UV warp modifier. So let's go down to the bottom, lift that up, and then let's find that again, lift it up again, and that's fine in its second position. Let's call this UV warp dot offset. And now the from can be the same as the other ones, the start and end that we had. And then our UV map can be the UV map warp offset. Now when we press Alt A, everything is fixed and we have our seamless procedural texture. I think what I'll do now is close out the properties sidebar, just clean this up a little bit, just move that down. Let's move this up slightly. Press shift and left click across that noodle line there. And let's just press G to move it. And then again, shift left click, press G to move that off to the side there. And this one, which I'm gonna go Alt P to just pop it back out of that frame and press N to bring open the property sidebar again. And actually this node here, just make sure we selected it. And I'm gonna call that mask as well. And now it's just a matter of hooking this kind of setup up to any of the other procedural textures that we think are gonna need that seam blending away. So let's check our next procedural texture up, our pulses layer and control shift click on the power node at the end of this frame. And let's just step through the animation with the left and right arrow keys. I'm just gonna hit the right arrow for now. And here we are, we've got a fairly obvious seam. So we know what we're doing now. So let's just go shift space and we'll correct this pretty quickly. Let's just border select everything above the pulses layer, including the pulses layer, move that up so that we have enough space to basically duplicate these nodes that are to do with the texture. So I'm gonna go Shift D, bring those down, Shift A to add in a color mix RGB node since this is where the magic happens. I'm gonna plug this one into the first socket since we want these swapped over. And our mask is here and we can plug that into our factor. Make sure we're using a warp offset and let's go Shift Space again and we can see that it's all fixed. Okay, cool, let's go up to the next layer up. Let's find our mid frequency noise. Let's control shift click this, shift space to take a look. 
and there's a fairly obvious seam running through there and I think we can fix that just as easily as we did with the last one. So let's zoom out a little bit, create the space we need, border select to cross all those, G to move them up a little bit, and it's just these two nodes that are to do with the texture. So let's go Shift D and duplicate them down, Shift A to add in our magic node, and there we go. And then let's plug this into the top so that they're kind of crisscrossed over there like that. And then let's grab our mask. Let's bring this out a little bit, actually. Let's bring that out to about there and then left click and drag from there to the factor. Shift and left click across this noodle line here and press G to just make that a bit neater overall. All right, so we'll also we'll swap that to our warp offset. Now let's go shift space and take a look and it looks like it's working. Alt A to play the animation and we have everything right there now. So let's move up a little bit. We have our star streaks, control shift click this. There is a seam there, but really I don't think we need to fix that. Let's move up a little bit more. Now we have our edge highlight and the end gradient, which don't have seams anyway. So let's control shift click this towards the end and then that should be our final result. Let's press Alt A to play that now and all our seams are blended right away. But you can see that we've not really got the full frames per second anymore. So what we can do is just, in fact, just shrink this window down a little bit like this. Let's zoom in a bit more and let's play that again. And we're pretty much on 24 frames per second. We can just keep on tucking this in until we hit that 24 frames per second, which looks like we have it now. So there we are. We're back up to speed. We're seamless and it's looking pretty cool overall, I think. So that's our material all pretty much nicely wrapped up. We've got loads of layers here and there's tons of variations we can do with this. But now I want to just suggest a couple of final other tweaks that we can make to this, which are pretty fast and easy. Let's just step forward using the right arrow to where we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And what I'd like to do is control the size of that light at the end of the tunnel. So the size of the end vertices on this cylinder, basically. So let's middle click and drag up on our modifiers. We'll make this nice and easy on ourselves by simply doing this with a simple deform modifier. Let's middle click and drag down and find it. Click on the up arrow above the armature. Let's take it above the bevel modifier as well. That's pretty much fine where it is. So now let's set that to taper and we've got our factor deform control now and that's all there is to it. So now we can make this large or small or whatever we want. I'm gonna set it to around 0.6. So I think we're done with the materials, we're done with the mesh. One other thing to consider is possibly taking a look at our scene nodes. Let's select to use nodes and take a look down here and find them. We've got nothing in our render buffer, so let's hit F12 to render and it should render in a flash. Let's hit escape and now let's turn on the backdrop and we won't see anything until we hit control shift and click on this to auto generate our viewer node. And what we could try is maybe a distort lens distortion. Just gonna drop that in there, control shift click on it. And then if we set this to fit, in fact, let's go full screen with shift space, alt and middle click to move that off to the side there. And if we set our distortion down to something like minus 0.2, we can kind of drag it and pull it away and make it feel a bit more distant there and shrink it even further. And we can nicely offset that by increasing our dispersion, which should also generate some interesting colors around the edge of the lens. Let's go shift space and take another look at a frame where it's twisting around a bit more, say something like that one, hit F12 and render this. So with that effect, it does add a little bit of render time onto it, but as you can see, it's not exactly taking very long to render at all. I think playing with these values until you get hit the sweet spot will really help sell the effect. But I'd consider just muting this really and just render it without. And then once the image sequence is rendered out, we just go shift A and add in the image and then find your image sequence and then plug that in and then unmute that obviously and then render that out to a new image sequence. And then it's all done. And that wraps us up. Time to return time and space back to how we found it. Thanks very much for joining us on this dimensional leap in the Space VFX Elements series by Gleb Alexandrov and me, AD Woros. 